All right, good morning. Welcome to Houston Oasis. All right, my name is Abhishek Mathur, and I'll be your MC today. For 10 years now, we have been Houston's own secular community. We are guided by our core values as shown behind me and on my t-shirt. My favorite ones are human hands solve human problems and meaning comes from making a difference. We have an exciting program for you this morning. We'll have uh, songs by Hank Roji. He's still coming in, don't worry, he's on the way. Uh, then we're gonna have a, first we're gonna have a short uh, community moment by Aaron Westerfield. Uh, we'll take a break and we'll come back for the main talk by Andrew Seidel before finishing off with the last song. Um, all right. Uh, now we're actually going to do the main talk. Uh, I'm going to introduce Andrew here. Uh, Andrew Seidel is an attorney check, specializing check, in... Check, uh, check. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, Andrew Seidel is an attorney uh, specializing in constitutional law and is currently the vice president of strategic communications for Americans United. Uh, he will discuss his new book, American Crusade, how the Supreme Court is weaponizing religious freedom. I have been reading it and the detail is incredible. I loved his previous book, The Founding Myth as well, which put a pin in the idea balloon of the United States being founded as a Christian nation. Uh, for those only online, uh, please post your questions in the chat window and we'll get to them during the Q&A session. Without any further ado, please help me welcome Andrew Seidel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming out <laughs> on Sunday morning. <laughs> so, religious freedom has long been a shield. It's this hallowed right that we all possess equally. It's embodied in the words that are etched into the front of the Supreme Court equal justice under law. And most importantly, at least in my mind, it's been long supported by a robust and strong separation of church and state. But not anymore. Not anymore. There is a well-funded, powerful network of Christian nationalist organizations and individuals, including individuals in the federal judiciary and on the Supreme Court itself that are working to weaponize the First Amendment. They are seeking to turn that protection of religious freedom into a tool, a weapon, to impose their religion on everybody else. It is about power and privilege and supremacy. And when I say they are weaponizing religious freedom, both here and in the subtitle of the book, I, I really do mean that. They are litigating to change the legal meaning of that right. And they are litigating before the Supreme Court. And the Crusaders, which is what I call the groups of people who are working to recognize religious freedom, this powerful, well-funded network, they're bringing these religious freedom cases that superficially seem to be about other things, that seem to be about a coach, and his religious freedom, or a playground and preventing Christian kids from getting skinned knees, or a 40 foot tall Christian cross on government property, or school choice. That's another popular one. But really, they are about privileging the right kind of conservative Christian at the expense of everyone else. Their goal is to use religious freedom to elevate conservative Christianity to this special favored place under the law, and everybody else is going to be a second-class citizen. And, well, I'll get into why in a second. I'll pause there for a moment. But in, Amer in this book, in American Crusade, I work to tell the story behind this push to weaponize religious freedom that we've really seen happen over the last decade. But that last decade is a culmination of a longer push. It goes back 
several more decades, really, I think, to probably Brown versus Board of Education, which desegregated the public schools. And I do, I do get into that. And I, I genuinely do not think you can understand what is happening in the country right now. And especially, you cannot understand what is happening in our courts right now without understanding this crusade. And this has been my entire career. I have lived this fight for the last decade. I litigated some of the cases that are discussed in this book. I briefed others on others. I have been on the front lines, in the trenches, fighting this fight for the last decade. And one of the things that I really tried to do in this book was to tell you the truth behind these cases. I think the media tends to balance, tends to prize balance over truth. And that is a big flaw when you're talking about Supreme Court cases. And we, we all tend to think of these cases as individuals, as one-offs, as, you know, this is just about this, this coach, or this is just about this, this playground and whether or not taxpayer dollars can fund the resurfacing of this playground, not as this long-running crusade. Now, we, we don't make that mistake in, with some other cases. For instance, in the fight to overturn Roe versus Wade, we kind of all understand that that is a much longer crusade, but the same thing is happening with religious freedom. And the cases have been warped and tortured beyond reality. This is a court, the Supreme Court now is a court of alternative facts. Anybody heard of the Kennedy versus Bremerton case out there that Americans United helped litigate? The, all right, the coach just wanted to pray at the 50-yard line. More heads are nodding. Yeah. Well, that case is a prime example of alternative facts working their way into a Supreme Court decision. So unlike a lot of popular law books, in American Crusade, I don't just repeat the story as told by the Supreme Court or the judges. I actually dig deeper. And part of that is because I was involved in these cases and saw them start from the very beginning and part of that is because I spent a lot of time in dusty archives and in uh, front of my computer watching like a lot of really esoteric videos and then a ton of time interviewing the people who were involved in this case or these cases, excuse me. So for instance, uh, for the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, this is the gay wedding cake case out of Colorado. I know, I know some of you have heard of this one and I know most of you probably are on my side, at least overall, but you probably don't realize how badly the facts and the law were warped in that case. Even if you agree with my side on the, out, on the not agreeing with the outcome of the case, right? You still don't realize how bad it was. And so for instance, for that case, I actually interviewed the gay couple that was involved because if you remember, that was a case about discrimination against a gay couple. A business, protected under the law of the state of Colorado said that it got to violate the civil rights law of the state of Colorado because the person who helped organize this limited liability corporation believed certain things. So therefore, he got to violate this gay couple's right. And... If you paid attention to the media narrative surrounding this case, by the time it got to the Supreme Court, what was it really about? It was about a poor, oppressed Christian artist who just wanted to bake cakes and didn't want to participate in a gay wedding. And the big bad government was forcing him to do these things. They won the media narrative completely. So I dug deeper and I interviewed the gay couple in this case. And I actually interviewed a couple of members of the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, which was enforcing the local civil rights law against this bakery. And these two people became the scapegoats for the US Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court said that these civil servants who had dedicated their careers and in public service to upholding civil rights said that they were anti-religious bigots. And that was how they scapegoated the case and decided in favor of the baker. And it's, it's, this is important because it's not just the facts that can be manipulated. It is also the law that can be manipulated. And so the other thing that I really strove 
to accomplish in American Crusade is to write a book that anybody could pick up and understand. Because I think that we legal professionals, <laughs> we lawyers like to sound like lawyers a lot of the time. And we like to mask what we're saying in levels of scrutiny uh, and esoteric judicial codes and all this legalese that brings these concepts, which are actually pretty simple, away from everybody else. And I think sometimes we hide behind those. And so I tried to shed all those trappings, all that bullshit, and just cut right to the heart of the matter in these cases and explain to you what is really happening, why it's really happening, and show you just how radical these Supreme Court opinions and the justices themselves are. Because I think when you cut through all of that, all of that prattle and piffle, there's a simple truth that lies at the heart of all of these cases. And that's that when religion and the law collide, the solutions are actually pretty simple. These cases are really not that difficult. And the Crusaders have done a remarkably good job at confusing the issue for us and making it seem, first of all, different than it factually is, but also harder than it is. And really, these cases are pretty easy to solve, unless there's an ulterior motive behind some of these opinions. So can a business, this limited liability corporation, refuse to serve gay people in violation of civil rights laws because the owner is a conservative Christian? Or can the government refuse to issue lawful licenses and documents because the person issuing those is a conservative Christian and the people requesting those are gay? Can businesses, any business, refuse to serve any LGBTQ person because their God says so? What if it's a black person? Can a city council ban certain religious practices in an effort to drive a religious minority out of town? Can Christian foster care agencies take public funds and then refuse to work with people of the wrong religion? What about erecting a 40-foot tall Christian cross on government property, using taxpayer funds to maintain that cross? Um, what about Ignoring rules that protect public health. Can one religious belief be given the force of law to deny half the population their bodily autonomy? Now, the answer in each of these cases hopefully sounds pretty simple to you. The answer is no. And I go through each of these cases and plenty more in this book and explain why these are easy. Questions of, of religious freedom can be emotionally fraught, especially in cases that involve children, but that does not make them hard. And one of the things that I really tried to do in this book was, again, explain without legalese how you resolve these cases. And so I came up with these three lines, which I'm looking at all of these cases, and to avoid, well, you know, I'm avoiding legalese, right? So I came up with very creative names for these lines. Line one, line two, and line three. Try to keep up. And the first line is really basic. We, we distinguish between action and belief. Right? Your right to act is limited. Your right to believe is not. In fact, Freedom of belief, freedom of thought is probably the one absolute right that we have under our Constitution. Every other right that you possess is and can and should be, should be limited in certain ways, including freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and the free exercise of your religion, right? So there's a difference between action and belief. So the question is, okay, well, if, if action can be limited... Where do we draw that next line? And the answer to that is where the rights of other people begin. And so this is line number two. 
right? Clearly the government can step in at some point and say your right to act on your beliefs is not unlimited. And if that action affects somebody else's belief, excuse me, affects somebody else's rights, if it harms them, if it takes away one of their rights to, say, be treated equally under a civil rights law, or to, say, receive birth control at no cost, then you have harmed persons' rights. You have trumped those persons' rights with your religious freedom, and that is not acceptable. And historically, that is where we have always understood that line to lie in this country, under this constitutional order. And then the third line is, I think, a prerequisite to really having the other two lines, and that is the separation between church and state. And I like to think of this in a couple different ways. I think we have done, we collectively on this side of the aisle have done maybe not the best job of explaining exactly what this rule means and exactly what it does. And so in American Crusade, I try to explain this separation in different ways and conceive of it in different ways so that it, everybody else can understand it. Uh, one way I really like to think of it these days is as an abuse of power. I'm going to move away from that speaker. Right? People who are in government are given certain limited powers by us. And not one of those powers is religious. Alexander Hamilton wrote in the Federalist number 69 that the government has, quote, no particle of spiritual jurisdiction. No particle. Right, so the, the government does not have the power to call for a national day of prayer. And when it does that, it is abusing. We have all kinds of rules in place to prevent abuses of power. Uh, you know, for instance, you can't use public office and the power of that office to personally enrich yourself or to sexually harass an employee. You, you do either of those things, you get run out on a rail, right? And I think it ought to be the same for violations of churches. So I do want to get to your questions because um, I know a lot of people have them based on the few talks I've done on American Crusade. I want to take a couple minutes to explain why we are having this crusade and also why I'm hopeful. Still, yes. <laughs> So why are Christian nationalists seeking this weapon? Why are they trying to form, reform religious freedom from that shield into that weapon? And the answer is that this is largely a backlash against equality realized. White Christian status in America has been riding. It's been on the wane. Has been for some time, right? In, in these culture war issues that we have, Culture wars is a, never mind. I'll get into that later. They're, they're losing their power and privilege. The, 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 the deference to which they are accustomed. You want a really prime example of somebody who's pissed off that people are not deferring to his conservative white Christian religion anymore. I would you to go watch just those in Rome earlier this summer. Or this past in summer anymore. Uh, this was after Bob's decision came down. He was speaking at a religious freedom summit put on by the Religious Liberty Initiative at Notre Dame, which has been instrumental in some of these later cases to help help this crusade. And if you listen to him, this is a man who is pissed off that the culture, the society, is no longer giving the deference to him and his religion that he believes it is due. And that truly is why we have this crusade. And this is actually a common sociological phenomenon. When the dominant group in a society feels threatened, feels its status threatened, it reacts. And it often reacts in authoritarian ways. It turns to authoritarianism. And the more it feels it turns to those strong men, turns to Christian nationalism turns to find a weapon to enshrine and retain that power and privilege. And that is, what they are, that is why they're doing this. That is what they are seeking. And, and there are studies that actually back this up. There was this, as I was writing, I found this really remarkable study from 2021 where simply mentioning 
the changing religious demographics in America would elicit this kind of threat response from conservative Christians, where they would turn towards Donald Trump and Christian nationalism if you just simply mention the fact that there are fewer Christians now than there were a couple years ago. So they conflate this demographic loss with a threat to their religious freedom, uh, which also suggests that they fundamentally misunderstand religious freedom. So really this crusade is a quest to remake this protection into a weapon for maintaining that power and privilege. That is what they are out to do. And I like to say that they're raging against the dying of their privilege. And so they declared war. And that war is this crusade. And I've been doing these talks for a while now, and I've found that people are a little heartened sometimes. So I do want to leave you with a little hope because I, I, actually, I actually am very hopeful. And I think that why, the why we are having this crusade is, is a reason to hope. And then I think we're doing a break and then I'll take questions. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, so okay. Why, Andrew, why are you hopeful if this is the case, if they've, if they've almost succeeded in this crusade? Their wins actually help our cause. And I know that's, that is incredibly counterintuitive, but their wins in the abortion case, uh, in the case of the coach imposing prayer on other people's children at public school events, uh, in the case of the main taxpayers being forced to fund religious indoctrination, their wins are actually swelling our ranks. And the reason for that is that they're creating this feedback loop. So if, if I am right, and I am, that the whole crusade is about this changing demographics, and white Christian nationalists are working to privilege this chosen few, they're creating a feedback loop. Every legislative and legal victory they notch is alienating more people. It's driving more people away from their movement, waking more people up to the danger. Now, I, my first book is subtitled Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American. It came out in 2019. The most frequent question I got asked by media was, what is Christian Now I'm getting call after call after Christian nationalism because people are finally waking up to this. They're crusading because we are working to meet the unmet promise in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, right? that, that all are created equal, that we the people means all the people. And previous generations have done a remarkably bad job at realizing those aspirational goals, and they've left it to their children to solve problems like slavery and segregation and the subjugation of half the population and discrimination against LGBTQ people and now the climate crisis. But as we continue to march toward progress, the Christian nationalists are fighting ever harder against it. They are raging against the dying of their privilege. But we will win in the end because they are fighting only for themselves. And it is a small, shrinking group of people that they are fighting for. So where they are selfish, we are selfless. We fight for we the people, all the people. That's what I do every single day at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. That's what AU's fight is dedicated towards, right? Freedom without favor, equality without exception. So there are more, I have plenty of concrete solutions in, in American Crusade, uh, but I do want to point out this even though I have a lot of hope, none of those solutions are fast. There's no silver bullet to fix this tomorrow. And we are, we are, we expect instant gratification a lot these days. And that, that is not going to happen as we fight back against Christian nationalism and against this crusade, right? They spent decades building power and building this network of crusaders to try to capture the federal judiciary. And they succeeded over the last four years, no, six years. We're not going to fix that overnight. 
I do believe we can fix it, but this is a long game and a long fight that we are involved in. And if you expect to win tomorrow, if you expect to win in the midterms, we might win in the midterms, but if you expect to win all this entire fight, you're going to be disappointed. So I do have hope, but I also have the expectation that we are in this for a very, very long time. This is going to be a long fight. So buckle up. And I'll leave it there for now. And then I'll turn it over to my friend, the MC, and then we'll, I'll, I will let you exhaust your questions, I promise. All right. Before we begin, I guess I wanted to uh, inform everyone that uh, there is a chapter, a Houston chapter for Americans United, and you can like their Facebook page and go to their website. Uh, you should be able to find them on Facebook. Um, all right. Uh, let's go with the first uh, question from Will. Uh, Hello. It's online. Yes. All right. I have some questions from uh, online. One of them, Naomi asks, we see many churches taking a political stance, which violates 501c3 status. Is there any incoming legal action in regards to this situation? Uh, so the question is about the Johnson Amendment, which prevents churches, charities, every 501c3, including churches which are maybe don't have that status explicitly, from wading into partisan elections. What it actually prevents is from them from endorsing a political candidate. It does not prevent any charity or church from weighing in on issues. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, the rule did not prevent Martin Luther King from speaking out on civil rights issues and was not intended to. It did prevent him from endorsing particular political candidates. Uh, this rule is known as the Johnson Amendment. It's um, we, in a weird part of the IRS code and regs, but everybody calls it the Johnson Amendment. Uh, it common sense and simple rule. What it, it attaches strings to your tax exemption, right? Because tax exemption is a privilege. It is not a right. There's no organization out there that has the right to be tax exempt. It is a privilege that we have said, if you are doing good works, if you are doing good works, we're going to let you be tax exempt. And as part of that privilege, we're going to attach some strings to it. And strings is that you cannot wade in because the whole reason you're tax exempt in the first place is because you're going out and doing good things with those donations. Partisan politics, good things, right? So we, basically, we want charitable donations words, not to partisan politics. So that is why we have this rule. The rule has been challenged in court, challenged as a violation of the First Amendment. Um, there is a church that said, no, we have a religious freedom right to say whatever we want and also to get our tax exemption. And the court said, nope, that's not right. But <clears throat> right now there is a very small vocal minority that is trying to challenge the Johnson Amendment and get it overturned. You will be shocked to learn that they are the same crusaders that I mentioned in this book. And I mean, really, the rule is actually like hugely popular. Uh, there's, there's a um, study done by the, the name of the polling group escapes me at the, at the moment, uh, but it's an evangelical polling group. And it found that depending on how you ask the question, something like 70 to 80% people, evangelical, that churches shouldn't be endorsing politicians from their pulpit. Um, there, when the rule was under attack from Trump uh, and the Crusaders, uh, there a number of letters were sent to the IRS, uh, like 3,000, 4,000 religious leaders, denominations, churches, nonprofits, all these different letters, huge support for this rule. It is wildly popular. And it's under attack from this small, conservative, mostly evangelical minority, the Crusaders, who are trying to get it overturned. Uh, this is not about free speech or the free exercise of religion. It's about power. They are successful in gutting that rule their churches become super PACs. 
unacceptable tax because right now, under the IRS rules, churches don't have to file any financial disclosures with the IRS. Unlike other nonprofits, so Americans United uh, every year files a Form 990 with the IRS, tracks every penny that comes in, every penny that goes out. You can see what money is being spent on. You can track it. We don't have that for these churches. And so they would immediately become, if, there were, if this rule were not in place, the subject of massive donations for conservative political action groups. And it would be completely dark. They are, they are black holes. And that's what, they're, that's what they're trying to do. That's what they're trying to create. Uh, so good rules should be in place, being challenged. So now to answer the question, is it actually being enforced? And part of the answer is we're not really sure. We don't really know. So if a conservative church part of this crusader network, uh, if the, the head preacher gets up in the pulpit and says, go vote for so-and-so, yes, it often does. Uh, who booed Greg Locke? No. Greg Locke burned my first book, so booing is appropriate. Um, with a blowtorch, actually. What's that? No, I, I sent him a cop. He and I got into a Twitter debate about, oh, about politics, actually. Um, and uh, I sent him a copy with what I thought was a lovely note inscribed in the front. And he filmed himself burning it with a blowtorch. Um, that's the founding myth why Christian nationalism is un-American. So if you need an endorsement for that book, there you go. Anyway, so Greg, Greg Locke, I don't, I don't remember what he, what he said from the pulpit, but he, he violated the rule. Americans United reported him, and then he actually said, well, I'm renouncing my tax-exempt status altogether. Um, and I was just talking with an AP reporter who's trying to follow up on that story the other day. But the, the problem is, we don't know what the result of that investigation is going to be. Unless Greg Locke does have a big mouth, mouth off, mouths off about it. Uh, every IRS investigation is confidential and secret. The only way you know about it is if uh, the church talked about it, or if they turned around and challenged it in court, and then that would that court case would be a public record. Um, but you know, so we don't we don't know how well the Johnson Amendment is enforced, really. Um, but we do have some indications that it's not anywhere near the kind of enforcement that we would like to see. Um, churches have lost their tax exempt status from this, but not any that we know of recently. Again, there's no real mechanism for us to know. So it's a little bit of a wishy-washy answer because we don't know, uh, but it really is an important rule and one that is absolutely worth defending uh, and, and shutting down challenges to. All right, we have another online question. Is, the Christ is, is Christian nationalism primarily acting through the Republican Party or is it also using the Democratic Party? So, part of, so we go from the Johnson Amendment question to the... Is Christian, I mean, I think Christian nationalism it has found a home in the Republican Party, for sure. I mean, if you've listened to anything Lauren Boebert or Marjorie Taylor Greene has said, first of all, I'm sorry. Second of all, it's, it, I mean, a lot of what they are saying is, is Christian nationalist rhetoric. Um, I mean, the, the bottom line is Donald Trump, <clears throat> and I talk about this in The Founding Myth, Donald Trump tapped into an undercurrent of Christian nationalism that had been flowing through our country since before it was founded, really. Um, and he tapped into it in a way that we had not seen previously. But the best predictor of a Trump voter in the 2016 election was not their party affiliation or some measure of economic distress or anything like that, but believing that the United States was founded as a Christian nation. That, that, that's the core tenet of Christian nationalism. I get into that in the founding myth, why Christian nationalism is un-American, if you are interested. Um, so, I mean, Trump really did tap into this in a way that we had, we had not seen before. There have been many previous waves of Christian nationalism throughout American history, where they've seized power, they've imposed uh, their Christian nationalist mottos on the country, for instance. 
Uh, and again, I get into all of that in the founding myth, but um, I mean, currently, yes, I would say it has found a home. And uh, one other online question, I wanna merge two into one question. What is your advice to people who want to help, who want to fight, who live in small towns, who are afraid to stand up or run in local elections due to being in a conservative area? Who aren't afraid to do those things? Who are, they, they want to help, but they are afraid to be, they are afraid. Uh, they're okay. afraid to do anything or run for local elections because they live in uh, conservative areas okay. here. So, I mean, first of all, I, I think voting is one of the most important things that you, you can do, but it is also literally the least you can do. I mean, vo voting is the bare minimum. Uh, it, it's Stacey Abrams likens it to taking medicine, which I think is a good metaphor. You have to do it, but it is not. Voting is not the cure. Right? Vote, voting gives us the chance to fix some of what has happened. In fact, we, we can't fix some of what has happened without people voting. Um, but it, it, it in itself is not the fix. And this goes back to what I was talking about at the end with setting your expectations and buckling up for the long fight. Because going into the voting booth and casting your ballot and expecting things to change as a result, is, that, that is not going to happen. Uh, that, that's the beginning. That, that's giving us the chance to maybe make some of those changes. That, that's the best case scenario. Um, so reshift your expectations on that point. Um, you know, it's still important. I think it's crucial to do organizing on the local level, groups like the Oasis here and the various free thought groups and activist groups here. Uh, I also think it's crucial on the national level to join those bigger groups. Uh, Americans United for Separation of Church and State is, is fighting the long battle right now. Uh, we have been for a couple years already working to build power uh, and change hearts and minds. That's, that's what we have been investing in uh, and you have to have that at the national level. So I'd encourage you to go join au.org. Uh, and then there are some other solutions in the book itself. Um, I would, I'll say two other things then. So one, despite the question, I would encourage everybody to go run for office anyway. Um, first of all, there are a lot of offices that you can run for that are unopposed. Um, the other side is certainly not shy about running for office. One common thing that I've heard both in the tour for American Crusade and then for the founding myth before we got hit with the pandemic was I would run for office. I'm not really qualified. I don't really want it needs to sit on the board. <sighs> Look at Marjorie Taylor Greene. Look at Lauren Bo. You are as qualified more so than anybody on that other side, truly. And this is one of the most important things. You, they, they are targeting every office at every level. Uh, and, and our side needs to be doing that same thing. Um, and you can't do that if, you're, if you don't want to do that, find somebody who will and help them organize and go knock on doors for them. Uh, I mean, th these are absolute crucial things. And then uh, the last really crusade is weaponizing religion. There are other. We sold out a book, a book, and you want to see the, I put the address back there. Uh, it's on my website, through my local bookstore. So every few days I go into the local bookstore and I'll personalize and sign copies there. So that way, at least you don't miss out. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry if you didn't get one, but yay, we sold out. We're not qualified. That's a wanton lie. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to come around with the mic. We have some time for Q&A, uh, but keep the questions concise. No statements, please. Just questions because we need to get to a lot of, uh, of them. If you want a shorter version of the book, just read Will's shirt. Good morning. 
Good morning. I really, Good morning. I really have enjoyed your talk. I, I got one uh, qu uh, question. It's pretty, pretty straightforward and simple and concise. <laughs> uh, does the organization that you're vice president of, Strategic Community uh, Communications for Americans United, oh, is there any type of court cases concerning the teaching of Darwinian evolution versus any type of creationism? Are y'all are y'all involved in any court cases right now, currently? So there are, there are no court cases going on right now, but we haven't seen an attempt to push that and to fight that in the courts yet. Um, historically, that is one of the areas where the courts have been the absolute best when it comes to enforcing separation of church and state. Uh, have not let creationism infiltrate our public schools in any real way. Every time it has been challenged, and AU was part of previous challenges, uh, including in the most recent case, which is was Dover versus which was 2005. That was, it's not creationism, it's intelligent design. And we're going to teach that, um, which got laughed out of court at the district court level. Um, and we haven't really seen it since then. I will say that I expect us to have to refight that battle again soonish uh, because of the success of the crusade because they've been winning so many of these cases. And I, I explained this in the last couple chapters of the book where I start talking about public schools, because that, that is sort of the last bastion of the separation of church and state. And it is one of the reasons that we are seeing this crusade from the very beginning, going back to Brown versus Board of Education. And I tell that story in American Crusade, and I expect them to try to be pushing this kind of stuff in the public schools again soon. Uh, after the Kennedy versus Bremerton case, where the court adopted. So, okay, I'm going to, we got time. Cut. This is the case of the coach who is imposing his Christian prayers on other people's children, using his power and status as a public school, high school football coach. Okay? So he's praying with other people's kids at the 50 yard line. We know for a fact, for a fact, it is in, indisputable, undisputed in the court that kids felt pressured to join his prayers. And the other side, the crusaders tried to sell this narrative of, this is just a coach engaging in a moment of personal uh, private prayer on the 50 yard line in the middle of the field. It was laughable. And the Ninth Circuit, one step below the Supreme Court, is looking at this case and really kind of in a remarkable passage calling out the lies of the Crusaders and saying that the coach's lawyers are spinning a, quote, deceitful narrative of the case. This deceitful narrative that the coach is just engaged in this moment of quiet, silent prayer, right? That, that he's not pressuring other people's kids to join him. And if a, if a court, if a, an appellate judge said that what I, my lawyering was deceitful and that I was engaged in a deceitful narrative and that this was un, what I was repeating was unreflected in reality. I would go bury my head in the sand. I would question my moral principles. I would probably not litigate for a little while. First Liberty Institute, the Crusader, based here in Texas, up in Plano, appealed to the Supreme Court. And they repeated that deceitful narrative to the Supreme Court, which tells you what they think of the conservative majority on the Supreme Court and what they are willing to do. And they were right. The conservative bloc on the Supreme Court adopted that deceitful narrative whole hog, every bit of it, to the point where Justice Sonia Sotomayor in her dissent included photographs, three, I've never seen that, debunking the lies, the deceitful narrative. So that case because the court adopted these alternative facts and then found in favor of the coach has emboldened the other side in a way that I've not really seen before. 
And we're not very deep into the school year yet, but we are expecting to see the other side very emboldened by this decision. And initial reports kind of indicate that that's happening. And I would not be surprised if in the near future we, are, we see it on the front of creationism, intelligent design, that kind of thing too. Um, so I, I'm sort of expecting that, but the short answer is no, that, that, that has been shot down time and time again. Um, but I, I do see it on the horizon. Um, I don't think you mentioned this in your talk, but I'm curious. What was it like to prepare your testimony for the January 6th committee, and how do you feel like it was received? Uh, so I, I, for those who don't know, I did submit testimony to the January 6th committee, select committee. Um, I helped spearhead it called uh, Christian Nationalism and the January 6th Insurrection. Uh, this was published by the Baptist Joint Committee with my previous organization, FFRF. Uh, and we had we a number of experts, uh, including Amanda Tyler from BJC, Jamar Tisby, um, uh, Anthea Butler, Andrew Whitehead, Sam Perry, they wrote Taking America Back for God, uh, Catherine Stewart, who wrote The Power Worshippers. And we wrote this, we each contributed sections to this report detailing the role that Christian nationalism played in the January 6th insurrection. Uh, it's available online. You can go read it. I would really recommend you go read it because you can't understand the insurrection without understanding Christian nationalism and the role it played. Uh, Congress, members of Congress got a hold of that. Uh, they actually talked about it on the floor of the House. Representative Huffman gave a little speech about it. Uh, and then members of the January 6th committee reached out and asked me to submit testimony based on my sections of the report and to supplement it. So I did that. Um, and it, my testimony, you can find, my testimony is only available on my website, andrewlseidel.com. There's a publications tab. You can go find it. You can read it. It's public. Um, and it'll be in the final, um, probably not the report itself, but they usually publish everything. So it'll be in there. Uh, and it was really, it was really, first of all, I mean, flattering to be asked. I'm glad that they're, they're focused on this as a role. You've noticed it's not part of the public hearings, which is probably smart from a political perspective, especially since Christian nationalism is just now sort of entering the, the mainstream lexicon. Uh, but, uh, I, so I catalog the, the dry runs that happens before January 6th, there were very clearly these Christian nationalist events. January 6th itself, all the imagery, the rhetoric that we saw that day, uh, the prayers of the Capitol, uh, pleading the blood of Jesus over the Capitol, the, the exorcism that was done in the Capitol to exorcise the demon Baphomet. Um, and then the role that local and state public officials played in that insurrection itself. Um, people like Cooey Griffin, who is in some serious trouble now. Um, so that's, that's the testimony. It was, um, it, you can go read it. I, I highly recommend it. Um, I mean, I wrote it, so I guess I would, but um, yeah. You're right ahead. here. Thanks for the excellent presentation. I got two questions. Um, do you think there's some irony uh, that the, in Iran right now, there are revolts against the theocrats. Do you think it'll come down to that if the Republicans win in November? And the second question is, is the whole, no one is above the law stuff that's going around and trying to get Merrick Garland to, to you know, uh, indict somebody, just a distraction from what's really going on in the background. Is George Soros paying you by chance? George Soros is not paying me anything. I know how to get some of that. I'd be, I'd be, I'd happily take his money. Um, I, I'm not going to make a prediction on the election um, other than to say, reiterate what I said earlier, which is that voting is literally the least you can do. Um, if you want to, if you want to win, especially voting is literally the least you can do. Um, well, and and your, your, your third question was indictments. Um, I don't know if it's a distraction or not. I, I don't know. Huh. I'm not going to weigh in on that either. I, I don't know. I don't know. 
Nope, I'm not going to weigh in on it. Yep, okay. yep, yep. I'm going to pump that one. Here in front. I would like to know how, since the U.S. is based on in God we trust, you swear on the Bible to take a office. Uh, it's on our money. It's in our Pledge of Allegiance. What can be done about that? I mean, it's basically what if you're a Muslim becoming a new citizen here and you're having to say those words? It just seems, I mean, that didn't come about until what, the 50s? Or is yeah. there any way to backtrack that? Yeah, I mean, and I, so if you are curious about that, that is the subject of my first book, The, the Founding Myth Why Christian Nationalism is Un American. Uh, all of these facts that were left by previous waves of Christian nationalism. Are we really founded as a Christian nation? Um, you know, I mean, that claim never, no, no real serious historians agreed with that claim. Uh, it was always a mask for pushing Christian nationalism. But we treated it for a long time as this like actual historical debate. And then I think on January 6th, you saw that mask really ripped off. And th this is not a historical debate about who we are. It is a, a exclusionary movement bent on seizing power in the here and now by any means necessary. Uh, that's what Christian nationalism is. And the whole, we're founded as a Christian nation, we're based on Judeo-Christian principles, is meant to declare that they are the true heirs of the American experiment. And that everybody else is second-class citizens. And that's why... The found up to the founding myth, or excuse me, the follow up to the founding myth is American Crusade, because these two things are bookend this entire history and this entire fight. Um, so I'd encourage you to go pick up a copy of that. Also, I do get into specifically that that question at the end of my testimony to the January 6th committee, because one thing you see is previous waves of Christian nationalism leave behind these disfiguring scars, like in God we trust, one nation under God, the National Day of Prayer, the prayer room in the Capitol all of which date to either the middle of the Civil War, 1863-64, or to the 1950s when you have this, this McCarthyism and this, this Red Scare and actual, um, these huge wealthy businesses trying to undermine the New Deal by turning people onto religion. <clears throat> what you really see is Christian nationalists taking advantage of times of national fear and crisis to impose their Christian nationalism on the country. Uh, and so I, I do talk about that in the test as well. <clears throat> Given that the two most recent Supreme Court justices essentially lied in their confirmation hearings regarding Roe v. Wade and other things, saying that they would uphold a settled case law, is there any realistic way to get them uh, impeached and removed for, by perjuring themselves under oath? So you know what the key word in your sentence was, I gather. Real. Realistic. No, I mean, okay, so the only way to remove a justice, they have lifetime tenure. The only way to remove a federal judge is impeachment. And they have lifetime tenure, it's written in the Constitution. It says during good behavior, that's long been interpreted to mean lifetime uh, appointment. Think of how much political capital the other side expended to put their collaborators in place on that court. I mean, everything. We know Leonard Leo, who is universally recognized as the man to pack the Supreme Court, we know he spent about $500 million in 2014 through Amy Coney Barrett to pack the court. You, they, they blocked a legitimate nominee for over a year. They ran roughshod over the country and credible allegations of sexual assault to put somebody in place. I mean, the rank hypocrisy of shotgunning Amy Coney Barrett onto the court after 60 million people had already voted in the election, despite the same rationale for, you know, all this, they stole seats. And they didn't do it to put their independent minded justices who were just going to decide cases based on the law and the facts who were just going to call balls and strikes. They did it to put in place people who would decide cases the way they wanted to. And they succeeded. And we saw how weak a check impeachment is when partisan politics play a role twice 
We saw that. And think of what they spent to get their, their people in place. So is there a realistic chance that we could impeach one of these justices? No. It's very easy to expand the U.S. Supreme Court, however. It's very easy. All that requires is getting over the filibuster to add four, six, ten, twenty justices to the Supreme Court. This is one of the things I talk about in the end of American Crusade. Much easier hurdle to clear politically, especially if you treat voting as literally the least you can do. Uh, and, and I think far, far more likely, and also just generally needed. Um, not to say that there are not serious problems with what some of these justices have done in the past. I think you'd be hard pressed to actually peg them as lying on Roe versus Wade. I think you'd be, I think they would simply say in response, I was telling the truth. It was precedent. And I did consider this case. I just considered it and came out the other way. I think that's what they would say. And I think, I think given the realities of impeachment, it doesn't really matter. But if we want to change the makeup of the court, which we should because it has been captured, there are much better ways to do that. We have a question here in the front. Uh, several months ago, there was an episode on 60 Minutes that pointed out how uh, wealthy Texans were gaining control politically. And also these wealthy Texans were uh, fundamental fundamentalist religionists. Now, the real question is, do you think that Citizens United leads inevitably to our having a plutocratic uh, governmental system, political system. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's inevitable. It's certainly, it's certainly not a good or correct decision. Citizens United, for those who didn't hear it. Uh, I'm not going to get into the ins and outs or the nuts and bolts of that opinion. Um, I will say that this is, this is also part of the crusade, too. It's, you can't it's all one and the same, right? You can't capture the courts and enshrine minority rule and give a tool, a weapon over to minority rule without also doing damage to our other institutions, right? It's, it's not a coincidence that this, is, this past term was one of the most consequential in Supreme Court history and that before that, they had gutted the Voting Rights Act, okayed partisan gerrymandering, decided citizens unite. I mean, all of these different things that related to political power and the people, the majority, exercising a political check on the other branches of government. Um, so I wrote, I, I mentioned earlier that Leo, Leonard Leo was universally recognized as the man who packed our Supreme Court um, and then he spent 500 million or so dollars doing that. Um, he just got a $1.6 billion donation, a single donation of $1.6 billion for his new outfit, which is more dedicated to uh, politics and electoral politics. And so I'm, I'm going to just read a quote from one of his former employees who described Leo's mission like this, quote, he figured out 20 years ago that conservatives had lost the culture war. Abortion, gay rights, contraception, conservatives didn't have a chance if public opinion prevailed. So they needed to stack the courts. Just really try to appreciate that. Because if democracy worked, we wouldn't win. If majority ruled, we lose. How can we subvert democracy? And they turned to the courts to do that. And then just to, to really highlight Leo's role in this, um, he, is the power he was the power broker at the Federalist Society. You've heard of the Federalist Society by now, I presume. The six conservative justices on the Supreme Court were all or are members of the Federalist Society, were at one point or are now. Um, 
And Leo is responsible for putting at least five of them on the court. And this is, what, this is how his job was described. He was, for judicial nominees, quote, the monitor of the various nominees' ideological purity. The monitor of the nominees' ideological purity. And we know for a fact that he was responsible for putting Roberts Leto on the court. He's the one who helped push through their nominations. The same thing for helping block Merrick Garland, putting Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett on the court. He is the guy who wrote the short lists for Trump to choose from. So he directly responsible for five of the nine members on the Supreme Court. The other conservative member being Clarence Thomas, who is an old friend of Leo's, former member of the Federalist Society. There's video of Clarence Thomas and Leonard Leo on stage. I actually think it's up in Dallas at a Federalist Society event. And they are joking about how Leo is the third most powerful man in America. He chose them for their ideology. And it is a crusader ideology. So I, uh, it, the point of that is to say that these cases, I, I touch on the religious freedom cases in this book, but I also do show that this is part of the larger crusade. This is one branch of that larger fight. Um, and I chose this because I think this is, as the demographics shift, this is going to be that core final thing that falls for them. And it's partly because they've done such a good job of confusing everybody about what true religious freedom should be, which is what I'm trying to untangle in this book. Yeah. Over here, we're officially in lightning round phase. Two, we have two more questions, one from this side, one from that side. Do you think there are any court cases or separation things that the Crusaders won't try and take on if they get the chance? Is there anything that they think is just politically yeah. not worth it? Yeah, really good question. No. There is no amount of power or privilege that will satisfy the Crusade. It's up to us to stop them, 100%. Uh, they, they, will, they will push and push and push. You're already seeing, and I mentioned this in the book, in, you're already seeing religious freedom come up in the, the most bizarre place. It came up as opposition to the infrastructure bill. Yeah, it, it's coming everywhere. Yeah, yes. Do the televangelists who uh, buy these jets and have fabulous... Do they have... Um, no, I mean... <laughs> I mean, they're very creative about the way they do it. And because there's no, no financial disclosures filed, there are, there are some very uh, useful provisions in the tax law for them. Um, now, they theoretically have to pay personal income tax on things, but there are also useful provisions for that. Um, so there are, I mean, it's not limited to televangelists, though, right? If you, if you have an eight-figure net worth or higher, like you're probably not paying much in taxes. You, there are ways around it. Um, but, yeah, I won't get... That's, that's a horse I'm happy to ride, but not probably right at the moment. All done? Okay. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, all right. So let's uh, begin now with, uh, with the community moment. This is a short 10-minute uh, talk given by the members of the community. Uh, today's community moment will be given by Aaron Westerfield on the subject of intermittent fasting. Looking forward to Aaron. Hello there. So quick show of hands. Who here would like to lose some weight? Have greater mental concentration and capacity? would like to slow down or even reverse some of the effects of aging? Well, for five low monthly payments of 1995, I know, I know, it sounds too good to be true, but stay with me. I'd like to spend a few minutes today talking about intermittent fasting, or IF. IF, in conjunction with exercise and a healthy diet, is helping me get back into shape after putting on some unwanted pandemic weight. So what is IF? How do you do it? How does it work? What are the benefits? Are there any negatives to it? So, a little history. Humans have fasted since antiquity, and much of the globe still 
does some sort of fasting today. Most fasting is done for cultural or religious reasons, but an increasing body of work is showing that fasting can have real health benefits as well. Before defining what intermittent fasting is, let me stress what it is not. It is not a diet, but rather it is a dieting pattern. In simpler terms, it's making a conscious decision to skip certain meals on purpose. By fasting and then feasting deliberately, intermittent fasting generally means you consume your calories during a specific window of time during the day and choose not to eat food for a longer, longer window of time. One of the most popular ways to fast is to do what is known as a 16-8 fast. That is fasting for 16 hours and then having an 8-hour feeding window. For me, this means skipping breakfast and only eating between the hours of noon and 8 p.m. Another popular method is one meal a day, which is just what it sounds like, restricting yourself to one healthy meal a day. So how does intermittent fasting help you lose weight? It works by two mechanisms how much you eat, and when you eat it. How much you eat is simply calories in versus calories out and is just basic math. If you eat more calories than your body uses in a day, you will store the excess energy as fat and thus gain weight. If you consume less calories than your body burns, you, uh, you have an energy deficit and you're going to lose weight. So to see how intermittent fasting can help with calories in and calories out, Let's say, to keep the math simple, that your body uses on average 2,000 calories a day. Further, let's say you eat three standard meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, averaging at about 800 calories per meal. That comes up to about 2,400 calories a day. So compare that to the 2,000 calories a day that your body needs, over time, you're going to gain weight. Now, let's say you're on a 16-8 eating plan and only eat lunch and keeping everything else the same, 800 calorie meals, you're now consuming 1,600 calories a day. Um, and even if you increase your meal size slightly to 900 calories a day to kind of make up for that missing meal, you're still only at 1,800 calories and versus the 2,000 calories, you're at an energy deficit and over time you'll lose weight. The second and more important way that intermittent fasting helps you lose weight is by when you eat or the timing of your meals. So let's explore what happens after you eat, eat, eat a meal. Immediately after eating, your body starts the digestion process, breaking down food into macronutrients. One of these macronutrients, carbohydrates, is further processed and released into the bloodstream as a simple sugar called glucose. This in turn causes your body to produce a substance called insulin. Insulin does two things. It stimulates the absorption of glucose into your bloodstream and tissues for a quick supply of energy, and it also prepares the energy for longer-term longer -term storage. Usually, the body does not need all of the energy that was consumed in a meal, so it converts the glucose it does not immediately need into its storage form called glycogen. Glycogen is initially stored in your liver and muscles to be, to be released when needed for the body's energy needs. When those glycogen stores are full, the excess is stored in your fatty tissue in the form of fat. After about three hours after eating, your insulin has been, tra and your insulin has been transporting glucose to, the, to power your cells, your blood sugar levels begin to drop. About nine hours after our last meal, all the food has been digested and the body stops producing insulin, but our body still needs energy. So, you so now we enter a new player, a hormo hormone called glucagon. Glucagon releases the previously stored glycogen into the bloodstream to ensure your blood sugar levels don't get too low and the body's energy supply is steady and insured. At 11 hours, the glycogen energy reserves are exhausted from your liver and muscles, so it's time to pull from your larger resource of energy, your fat reserves. Yay! Unfortunately, this is when most people break their fast with the aptly named breakfast. But we're not done. Oh no. 14 to 16 hours into your fast, your body enters a state called ketosis. As a byproduct of burning fat, your liver, liver produces a product called ketones, fatty acid molecules made when fat cells are broken down. Ketones are the heart, vital organs. Ketones also activate your nerve cells, strengthen intellectual uh, capacity, and develop new cells from your brain stem cells. 
They are the reason many people feel more productive and better able to concentrate during a fasting period. 16 plus hours of fasting, your body enters a process known as autophagy. Autophagy, old cell components are recycled and renewed. This not only makes the cells more efficient, it also prolongs the life of your cells and can slow down and even reverse some aspects of aging. As I said in the beginning, I know it sounds too good to be true, but this is not homeopathy or other essential It has sound research by reputable sources such as Johns Hopkins, the Mayo Clinic, and the National Institute of Health's National Institute on Aging. In fact, the NIA found that scores of human clinical trials can lead to improvements in conditions such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers, and so what does this look like? Five or six days, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, I do a 16-8 or an 18-6 fast and have my eating window from noon to 6 or 8 at night, kind of depending on what's going on. on Wednesday, I usually do one meal a day in the evening. Usually I adhere to a fast. Um, I also try to exercise, even if just a short, brisk walk, before I break my fast. While I'm in ketosis to get some additional bang for that. Um, another question people like to ask is can you drink during a fast? Yes. Staying hydrated is very important, so you can and should drink, but just don't drink any calories. Plain water is, of course, best, but you can also drink coffee or tea as long as there's no cream or sweeteners in it. The research is mixed on diet sodas, which is a personal favorite of mine, but I usually tend to avoid them during a fast. What about getting hungry? It happens, especially at the beginning. You're going to have some hunger pains and some discomfort. Um, starting intermittent fasting after eating all the time might be a bit of a jolt to your system. However, after you transition for a few days, the body adapts and learns to function just as well, only eating once or a few times a day. Although I fast for 16 to 18 hours per day with no issues, the following bit of research might assuage your fears that skipping breakfast will cause your body to eat itself and your brain to implode. A recent study found that after 48 hours of fasting, cognitive performance, ability, sleep, and mood are not adversely affected in healthy humans by two days of calorie deprivation. And you're not going to be fasting for any more time than that. If you are truly having some hunger pangs, a, a trick is, instead of just jumping into a 16-hour fast, just try to delay your first meal of a day, for your first meal by an hour each day until you get to the feasting window that you want. According to the Mayo Clinic, besides hunger, other unpleasant side effects may include fatigue, insomnia, nausea, and headaches, but they usually go away within a month. Again, it's just kind of that transition period. By now, you may be saying to yourself, hey, I'm sold. Let's do this thing. But hold on. I, uh, intermittent fasting may not be for everyone. If you are under the age of 18, are pregnant or breastfeeding, have diabetes or other blood sugar issues, gallstones, kidney stones, or a history of eating disorders, you need to consult with your doctor to see if intermittent fasting is appropriate for you. Also, do not fast for more than 24 hours. Talking to it. I know, it sounds like a prescription commercial. Sorry about that. I hope I have educated you on the benefits of intermittent fasting and maybe even inspired you to try it for yourself. If you do, let's get together some morning and discuss it over a cup of coffee, but just coffee. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. That was informative. We do have donuts, though. <laughs> All right. Um, let me uh, do some announcements for now. Uh, first, I want to thank the volunteers who showed up to the food bank yesterday. We sorted uh, seven pallets of senior boxes, which was uh, over 9,000 meals. Now you say, how do you join the next one? Well, we got a bunch of options. Private Facebook group, Meetup, Discord, and even a snazzy website. HoustonOasis.org. You can ask some of the regulars or anyone in the back during the break how to get in. Uh, next, 
community groups. Uh, these are groups uh, around the city who are trying to meet and have discussions or you know, just dinner on a, you know, on a weekday night. Um, we want to start them up in the different parts of the metropolis. So we need hosts and participants. Sign up sheets are in the back. Also, Andrew will be signing books in the back as well. I got mine here, right here. They are for sale for 20 bucks, uh, down from a retail price of 28. Uh, before we take a short break, uh, I'd like to go over some of the announcements again. Uh, as I said, uh, Andrew will be signing books in the back, and uh, they're for 20 bucks. Uh, you can do the donations uh, through, uh, through the various methods out here on that paper there, or there's always cash. Uh, the, I'd like to remind you to sign up for the uh, community moment, uh, groups uh, as well. And, uh, well, I would say first, say hi to someone new. Thank you for, for everyone coming in, uh, all the new people coming in here. It's uh, good to be uh, good to see you all. All right. Uh, uh, lastly, I'd like to mention that uh, we are still a 501c3. Uh, we're, uh, we, we, uh, we run an all-volunteer organization right now, but this space uh, takes the money to run. So uh, we have uh, various methods of donation, and uh, you can uh, help uh, with Alexis in the back. We have a hat there. Uh, that we can uh, we can we have in the back, and also we have uh, the various methods on uh, online. Um, the QR code is there, so please help out uh, if you can. Otherwise, thank you, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we have one more. Yeah. Hey, guys, um, we have a lot of folks here today. Um, almost a hundred um, in the room and online. So great. Um, I would like to, some of you came in while um, Andrew was speaking, and so I just want to point out the welcome table, which is right next to the table with the hat, and so come on by and get information about our group. We have an email list and a Facebook group and information about all of our other activities, and we'd um, love to get you signed up. Thanks. All right. Uh, that reminds me, in two weeks' time, we have uh, Hemant Mehta coming in the, uh, from the Friendly Atheist blog. So come in, and if you can help out, that would be great as well. And um, we'll see you uh, next week. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, one more thing, I guess, uh, last thing, I guess, uh, at this point. Uh, we have... Uh, Apparently, there's, uh, there's some protests going on in Iran. So uh, yeah, related to that, there is a, uh, there's a protest at City Hall uh, this evening uh, at 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, if you want to contact, uh, you can contact someone in the back there. And that'll, that'll be it. Thank you. Join us for lunch. Thank you. Mm -hmm.